Well, good morning, church. If you uh, haven't been with us for a few weeks or you aren't aware, we're in the middle of a series called SHAPE. And SHAPE is an acronym that was created by Eric Reese, who's one of the pastors over at Saddleback Church. And the theme of SHAPE is trying to figure out how God made you and how you can serve God based on how God made you. Now, we've already gone through several of these uh, letters in the acronym that makes up SHAPE. We went through the S, which is about spiritual gifts. We went through the H, which is our heart desires. And last week we went through A, which is our abilities, the natural abilities that God gives us. And this week, Brother Brian asked me to preach on personality. And early on in preparing a message for personality, I hit a rock. And it's when I did a word search for personality in the Bible. I usually use the ESV version. That's, that's just my personal preference. But when I did a word search in ESV, I got zero results for the word personality. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go to NIV. And so I did a word search there, and I got zero results. So I went over to the Holman, zero results. Same thing over and over, repeat the process with multiple translations. Did not hit the word personality once. And I can't help thinking maybe Brother Brian did that on purpose going out this week. But uh, so anyway, I started to think, you know, how do I preach on something on a word that's not even, as far as I can tell, in the Bible? So I decided to go to the, uh, I decided to go to the dictionary and look it up, see what personality means. And this is what I pulled up. This is from the Oxford Dictionary. It says that personality is the quality or collection of qualities which makes a person a distinct individual. It's a distinctive personal or individual character of a person. And once I got that, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief because while the Bible doesn't use the word personality, it has a lot to say about you being made an individual, distinct person in the image of God. So let's uh, start by getting into why personality matters. I think that's an important foundation to lay before we start talking about our own personalities. Why devote a week to personality? Why does personality matter? I think primarily personality matters because God has a personality. Believe it or not, this surprises some people when I say this. Uh, there are those that kind of view God as this emotionless, distant man in the sky. He's always stoic. He never feels. He just kind of passively observes. But Christians have always affirmed that our God is both perfect and personal. You know, we have a God who basically... He experiences emotions, is what I want to say. He has passions. He has desires of his will that he wishes to see fulfilled. God experiences things like joy and anger and sorrow. The fact that we have personalities comes from the fact that we were created in the image of a God who has a personality. And no aspect of God can be said to be unimportant. Uh, God's personality matters, but so does your individual personality. Your personality matters because it was a gift given to you from God. He designed it specifically for you. The pastor, James Montgomery Boyce, whom I love to read his sermons, he he wrote this when he was in a sermon about creation. He says this, The secular world does not deny that there is personality in the universe, but they conceive that this personality somehow arose from an impersonal substance. We, Christians, maintain that the universe exists with form and personality because it has been brought into existence by an orderly and personal God. God was there before the universe came into existence, and He was and is personal. He created all that we know, including ourselves, and consequently the universe naturally bears the marks of His personality. Eric Reese said this in a uh, simpler way in the Shape book when he said that God has instilled a unique personality in each and every one of us for His glory. And so before we even delve into personality and really get into studying it, I just want to remind you that God made you to be you. If God wanted you to be someone else, He would have made you someone else. You were created to magnify the glory of God in your own unique and special way. And this message is going to be devoted to helping you understand that and helping you understand how you can do that with the way that God created you uniquely. 
And I think the first thing we have to do is recognize what your personality is. Before you can start asking what you were made to do, you have to understand how God made you. Knowing yourself is the first step to knowing how God might be wanting to use you. Uh, or I like to say it, understanding yourself through God's eyes is necessary for understanding your place in this universe, why you were created. And I want to stress that you need to understand yourself through God's eyes. I think that's, that can't be overstated. I feel that when we look through our own eyes, there's often a tendency to underestimate ourselves. I, uh, I was looking through scripture, and one account that always jumps out to me is Exodus 4, verses 10 through 15. And this is the passage where God has called Moses in the burning bush to go to Pharaoh and to set his people free, and then to lead his people to the promised land. And what I think is funny about this is Moses is aware of himself. He's aware of his own strength and own weaknesses, and he determines that even though God has called him, God must have made a mistake because he's not fit for the job. Here's the way Moses says it. It says, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since. You have spoken to your servants, and I am slow of speech, and I am slow of tongue. The Lord said to Moses, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you the way that you should go. You see, we all have a unique personality. Some of us are outgoing. Some of us are more reserved. Some of us like to cooperate. Others like to compete. We have people who are natural followers and those who are natural leaders. And that's all important because understanding that about yourself can help you figure out where God might be placing you. But at the same time, don't ever write off that God might be calling you to do something just because you don't feel like it's a natural fit for you. And Moses' eyes, he didn't see himself as being able to do what God called him to do because he wasn't a good public speaker. He talked slowly. Some people think he might have had a speech impediment. But God... Moses was able to do it, and therefore Moses was able to do what God called him to do. Another good example of this is uh, in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And this is when God has called the prophet Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel. And Samuel sees David, the young shepherd boy. And in Samuel's eyes, he's already written off David before David even has a chance to speak. Uh, here's what the Lord says. He says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected Saul. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. So here's the thing about Samuel. Samuel had already picked a king, and that was Saul. And Saul, by all accounts, met the criteria for what a king should be. Saul was tall, he was handsome, he was strong. He was the type of man that men looked up to. He was the type of man that people wanted to follow. David, in contrast, was small. He was young. He hadn't led anything other than sheep in his entire life. He was sensitive because he wrote music and played the harp. He just didn't fit what you would think a king should be. But God called David to be a king. And even if it wasn't David's natural personality or leaning, God called him, and therefore he was able to do this. So we need to take this to heart. God created you, and God designed you, and God knows you better than you know yourself. God gets to tell you what you can and can't do. So we need to primarily be listening to God's calling in our lives. So we recognize our personality. The second thing we need to do is we need to render our personalities to the glory of God. Once we understand our personality, we have to be willing to submit to whatever God is calling us to do with these personalities He's given us. You have to choose how you use your strengths. And you also have to choose what you do about your weaknesses, because we all have them. So if we're going to use our personalities to the glory of God, we have to get some basics out of the way. The first basic is this. All personalities do have strengths. And I want you to understand that. You have strengths, whether you realize it or not. There are things that you are good at, there are things that God made you for. There are things that will come naturally to you. 
And I know people that have amazing gifts and just will not acknowledge it. They will not acknowledge that God has gifted them in this way. And that's very frustrating. Because you want people to be used for the glory of God, and they just won't recognize it. It might be a self-esteem issue, I don't know. But we have to realize we do have strengths. Uh, The preacher Philip Brooks described preaching as this, the communication of divine truth through human personality. Now, he was talking about preaching, which is the thing I'm doing right now, but I think this applies to all levels of ministry. It's not just preaching. We can often falsely assume that God only calls one type of personality to ministry, and that's just not true. Every person has a unique personality with unique strengths, and we need all types in the church. We need preachers and teachers and natural leaders. We also need servants and givers, and we need problem fixers. We need quiet prayer thinkers. We need wise wisdom sayers. We need gentle child keepers and silly game players. We need those good with money and those who like to cook. We need those who take risks and those who play by the book. We need some to sing songs and some creative creators, and we even need a few who will work with teenagers. But the point I'm making, and this saying is true, is that God made you special and there is a place for you. And some of us try to work poems into our sermons and it doesn't really work. <laughs> I had to do that. As the Bible puts it, though, in Romans 12, 4 through 6, uh, Paul writes this. He says, For as we are in one body, we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. So, though we are many, we are one, one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace of us, let us use them. Your personality was put into you by God to be used for God's kingdom. Just as all of our personalities have strengths, we also should be aware that our personalities have weaknesses too. All personalities have weaknesses. The last passage I read came from Romans 12, and it was talking about how we all have a different function and a role to play. It compared us to body parts in the human body. But now let's look at how we're supposed to come to understand uh, our strengths and our weaknesses. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, Paul wrote this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. I want you to know any person can take a personality test, uh, but Christians are, due, are called to do more than just play to our strengths all the time. That's kind of a secular view of it, that we figure out what we're good at, and then we just do that. Uh, We're also called to give ourselves fully to God, to do what He wants to do with us. We need to filter everything through prayer, through the study of the Word, and through submission to God. We don't need to go too quickly into things. I'm naturally an introverted person. That's just the way I am. That's the way God made me. It's not my natural tendency to get in front of people and speak or to even be a leader. I'm a much better follower. I love to follow. But God called me to ministry. You've heard Brother Brian, if you've been here in the past, give a similar testimony. He was much shyer than I was. Brother Brian didn't like to talk to anybody, even one-on-one. But God called him to ministry, and so he went. I'm not saying you don't need to uh, play to your strengths. What I am saying is don't underestimate yourself. Know yourself, but don't underestimate what God can do through you. We need to trust the Holy Spirit in this. One of my favorite, favorite Christian writers of all time is this old guy named Andrew Murray. He lived hundreds of years ago, but he wrote some amazing books. And he wrote this about personality. He said, being filled with the Spirit is simply this. The whole of your personality is yielded to God's power. And when the soul is yielded to the Holy Spirit, God himself will fill you. The question we should ask ourselves is not, how do I want to serve God? Which I feel is often the question we're guilty of asking. I think the question should be, how did God make me? 
And how does he want me to serve him? So, we recognize our personalities and we render our personalities to God. So what's left to do? Our last point is basically a reminder that we need to keep our eyes on the prize. We have an earthly goal, but we also have an eternal goal. With all the hustle and bustle of life, it's very easy to kind of lose track of what we're actually here for. What are we here to accomplish? Uh, So basically, the third point I want to make, and this will be the last one, is that we need to remember the ultimate purpose of our personality. The ultimate purpose of your personality is twofold. While you're here on earth, I believe the ultimate purpose of your personality was meant to help you play a part in the great mission of the church. The church's mission is to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do the things that Christ commanded. Now, we can do that through preaching. We can do that through door-to-door evangelism. We can do that through a tons, of, tons of ways. There's so many ways to do it. I believe you're meant to play a part in that. And I need you to figure out how you are called to play a part in that. I don't believe any Christian is exempt from this calling. And I want you to know that even if this doesn't feel like something comes naturally to you, that's okay. God created a beautifully diverse collective of people, and he called them the church. And he created them with a wide range of personalities in order to declare his gospel in a wide range of unique ways. I've seen some very creative ways to reach people. I've seen people do it through football games. I've seen people do it through art. I've seen people, you know, do it at comic cons. There's so many different ways to reach people, and I believe that God wants to do it through what comes naturally and good to you. He made you that way on purpose. And if you don't think you're qualified for this, or you don't think you have the right personality or temperament for this, I mean, let's just look at some of the people that were leaders in the very first church. You had the obvious Peter. He was the rock upon which Christ said the church would be built. He led the first church. And Peter was brash, Peter was passionate, he was impulsive, and he was zealous. Peter was the type of guy who was really energetic, ready to go, and he often put his foot in his mouth. He often said the wrong thing, he jumped to the wrong conclusion, he spoke before he should have spoken, he didn't stop to think. But God used him in a big way. On the other hand, you have the disciple John, who appears much more meek, much more reserved, much more introverted, almost to a fault. There's one point where John has a request for Jesus, but he's too scared to ask for himself, so he sends his mom to make the request to Jesus. I mean, John was this very reserved person, and yet he was the disciple that Jesus loved. Whether you're a Peter or you're a John, God has a place for you. We also have people like Paul, who were very... I mean, he was very smart, very eloquent, poetic, thoughtful. He was well-spoken. He liked to, he liked to go on and on and just use all these big language, and he, was, he liked to kind of flout how smart he was. But then you also had people like Mark, who was very meat and potatoes to the point. If you ever read the Gospel of Mark, it's almost funny. Mark does not waste time. Mark says, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, and done. Like, Mark wants to get to the point. He doesn't want to dilly-dally. He doesn't want to waste time. Whereas Paul will just wax on and on and on forever. But God used both of them. And God wanted both of them in his church. You also have people like Barnabas, who was said to be the son of encouragement. He was so optimistic. Everyone that was around him felt uplifted. But you also had Thomas, who was the eternal pessimist. I love Thomas. One of my favorite little sayings in the Bible is when Jesus wanted to go to Bethany. And Thomas was willing to go, but he had to throw in his pessimistic input, and he said, let us go also that we may die with him. I love that. Thomas was willing to go. He wasn't saying, I won't go, but he's saying, you know we're going to die when we get there. Like, they're going to kill us, Jesus, but okay, I'm, I'm coming. Thomas was such a pessimist. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was the one guy who wasn't in the room to see him, and he says, I don't believe it. I need to touch him. I need to touch the scars in his hands. I need to see it. This, can't, this is too good to be true. But it's not like God didn't use Thomas. God used all of these people. So no matter what your personality is, whether you're outgoing or reserved, whether you feel like you love to speak or whether you hate talking, 
whether you're the type of person who's always on the bright side or someone who just feels like they're always looking for the flaws. God uses you, and you're needed here. You know, you bring balance to us. You bring something to the church that wouldn't be here without you. There is no other you. You're the only one of you that God made. And he wants you here, and he wants you to be used. So that's the earthly goal, but there's also an eternal point to your personality. And this is something I get very excited about when I think about heaven. I get asked weird questions about heaven. Uh, It seems like a lot of people are curious about it. They want to know what it's like. And some of the questions I get sometimes are questions like, will we all look alike in heaven? Or questions like, are we all going to be exactly the same? You know, will we tell each other apart? Will I be able to look over and tell that that's grandma? Or that's, you know, my friend from elementary school? Or are we all going to be like this one, like bland, wearing the same outfit, you know, angels or something like that? I don't think that's the way it's going to be. God created you in a good way, unique. He created people with this wide range of colors and shapes and sizes and with a wide range of personalities and quirks and little nuances that make us all unique. And I believe he did that intentionally. And I think it's silly to assume that that's going to change when we get to heaven. One of the preachers that happens to agree with me is a guy named Charles Spurgeon, who I often like to quote. He was so good at summarizing things. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said that there will be in the bodies of the righteous an undoubted personality of character. So, my brothers and sisters, there are differences among us here. No two bodies are exactly alike. There are marks in our countenances and in our bodies confirmation that show that we are different. We are of one blood, but not of one fashion. We were put, when we are put into the grave, we will crumble back and come to the same elements. But when we rise, we shall every one of us rise just as diverse. What I want you to get from that is this. Your personality is a gift from God. And when we come together, our differences are not a weakness. Our differences are our strength. We were created uniquely and wonderfully, so that in our own special way, we can glorify God Almighty. And in heaven, I believe that's what it's going to be like. I believe we're going to see people from all different nations, people of all different characters and personalities and traits, and we'll all be united. There's going to be no more tears or pain or suffering. We'll all be able to walk with God and worship Him forever, without end. And it's so beautiful when we look at how divided the world is to think that that's ultimately the end we're striving for. And not just striving for, the end that we're guaranteed. It's promised. It's a sure thing, 100%. Just as the sun will rise tomorrow, we guarantee that this day comes. So, you're created uniquely and wonderfully. You were created special. You were created with a purpose and with a way to serve. I'm going to challenge you to figure out how God's calling you to plug in. And I think you can plug in whether you're a pastor, a preacher, a plumber, or a teacher, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, an athlete, a dentist, a mailman, or a clerk, a stay-at-home mom, or currently out of work. Whether you're shy or meek or outgoing and loud, God made you that way. And I think you should be proud. Your Father, He loves you. And He calls you to go. And in your own special way, help His family to grow. But our time is up, and my sermon is through. But before we depart, let me pray for you. <laughs> Lord, I thank You for uh, letting us gather here today. And thank You for...